Let's pray. Lord God, we pray this as we look into your word this morning, that you will give us understanding and insight, help us to apply it to our own lives, that we may be truly united, a united people in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, was Jesus running away? We have the sentence there in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. And you might get the impression that Jesus was indeed running away from the Jerusalem area and getting out to the outback somewhere. It may be that John's imprisonment, John the Baptist's imprisonment, was part of the reason that Jesus went north. So it would be something like a strategic retreat. After all, uh, John's death would have created, may have created a climate which put Jesus' own ministry in danger. And he still had three years in which he needed to minister before he was ready to go to the cross, before his time had come where he sacrificed himself. However, there's a more likely reason for the move north. And that was that with John's imprisonment, his uh, ministry, John's in ministry as a forerunner to Jesus Christ was over. And Jesus' ministry was beginning again, was, was ready to start. And it was starting, not so much in Jerusalem where you might expect Jesus to have started in the religious center, but in Galilee, way to the north, an area that was foretold in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 9, 1 to 2, which we read just before, uh, which Matthew also quotes. He says, uh, in future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has shined or dawned. So Jesus brings light into dark places. And when you think about Galilee, Galilee was somewhat looked down upon by Jews down in the south, in Jerusalem, the big smoke. Uh, Galilee was sort of the outback, you know, it was it's where, where people had been invaded, you know, the people of the north had been invaded. Any, any uh, great powers coming from the north would have gone through Galilee and frequently did. Assyria did that and uh, took the people from the north away. And so you've got a sort of mixture of Jewish background and it was infiltrated by Gentile background as well. And in fact, when Alexander the Great came through in 300 and something BC, um, they left the Greek culture, which very much impacted on Galilee. It impacted on the north. So there was the Greek culture and many of the people, many Galileans spoke Greek as, an, as a second language, if you like. So it was quite common that Galilee would be referred to as Galilee not of the Jews, but Galilee of the Gentiles. That is exactly where Jesus goes first, to the area where people looked down on these people of Galilee. Now today we are observing Aboriginal Sunday, and although this is a little bit of a tangent, I think it's important that we address some of those things. As we look back over the years of white occupation in Australia, we see that the original occupants of the land were also looked down on over the years by later settlers. We are probably quite aware, because it's brought to our consciousness over and over again, of the ignorance which led to dispossession and massacres and various injustices of all sorts over the years. And we realize, I hope, the, re the pain of that history which remains in the consciousness of so many particularly indigenous people, and that the problems arising from those things still persists in the present day. Now, we may blame all sorts of people and all sorts of reasons on this. You, know, you, you even hear people say, well, it was their own fault. Um, but that doesn't help. Whoever's fault it is, there is a problem there. As Christian people, we are called to help people in the world to be able to see the light, to show compassion to people. Here we are to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who was empowered by his, by his spirit, by the spirit of God, and guided by God's word even in those days. We are to be the same. We are to be guided by God's word. We are to be guided by the spirit as we engage with other people, which should not be other people. It should be one people, particularly in the Christian context, one people in Jesus Christ. Back in the uh, 1970s, I was a, a school teacher, primary school teacher, and I was part of a group of teachers who put together a study unit on Aboriginal, Aboriginal study unit uh, for primary schools in the Hunter Valley. And we worked with some of the Awabakal people who gave us information and with Perse Haslam in Newcastle University who was something an ex of an expert on the subject and went around recording um, the, the stories of the elders and got, got a lot of information together. He took us to various sites and so on. My part in the unit was to provide study material, questions and discussion material uh, on early white contact with indigenous people. So I did quite a lot of, I did a bit of reading around the subject. And I have to say there were some appalling accounts of the way people were treated. I did take some heart from the work of one uh, Reverend Lancelot Threkel, there's a good name for you, Lancelot, <laughs> who uh, worked especially with the Awabakal people. Um, and he was doing translation work with them and uh, he spoke up frequently about the inconsistencies in the justice system towards Aboriginal indigenous people. Despite the injustices, I have spoken to Aboriginal pastors in the, in the uh, past who tell me that Aboriginal uh, spirituality before the coming of the white man to the shores of Australia embraced very much the understanding of a creator God. But even some sorts of insights into Jesus, there seems to have been some sort of awareness. Now how that come, came about or how it comes about, I can only assume it's by some sort of revelation through the, the deep spirituality of, uh, of Aboriginal people, that God has sometimes, at some stage, spoken into the, into the culture. Nevertheless, these, uh, these Aboriginal pastors who talked about the, 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 that spirituality from way back also were grateful for the revelation that had come through the scriptures being brought to the land. Because here, within the scriptures, we have a fuller revelation of God's purpose for the world and a full revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that I've heard that while indigenous people have often been overlooked or regarded as being sort of in the too hard basket, many of the problems, and there is a diversity of thinking which makes it additionally difficult, we tend to sometimes just shunt the, say, well, it's a problem, we just put it to one side and ignore what's going on. And it's very easy to do that. But I noticed that God has blessed Aboriginal communities in the past, Christian communities in particular, with revival and with Christian growth. Building on their already, already that, that existing spiritual awareness. I would commend to you the work of the, uh, the Nungalinya College, which... Uh, a number of Ang Anglican churches um, support, which goes on in Darwin. They train, our, train Aboriginal pastors for ministry. They average something like 279 students each year, according to their website. And they're impacting something like 100 communities with the gospel. So there are great things happening, and a lot of this stuff doesn't get into the news. But there have been wonderful things happening in those sorts of communities. And where the where the gospel is going out, where the light is going out into those communities, there is change that is taking place that cannot be imposed simply by government because it's a change that takes place within, from within. Now today I don't want to get into the whole politics of the voice to parliament. Uh, I was reading a Sydney Morning Herald article yesterday and they were saying that they'd canvassed a number of uh, indigenous people and there seemed to be while they're, they're broadly in favour of the idea, there's, they seem to need to want to have more information, just as everybody does, about what that will actually involve. But I would just mention, with coming up to Australia Day on the 26th, that surely it ought not to be too difficult, because this is going to come up every year, something that divides our nation. 
Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult for us to compassionately consider our Aboriginal sisters and brothers and to put ourselves in their shoes and to imagine what it would have been like if we had been dispossessed in the same way that many of them feel they have been um, uh, in the, uh, on the date of Australia Day. It shouldn't be too difficult for us to change the date. But I put that out there for you to pray about and to think about and to have an opinion about. I was horrified uh, reading in, on Facebook that people seem to be so inflexible about changing the date. And I think it's, it's not that old. You know, 26th of January is not that old a, a date in Australia's history that we couldn't change it to something else for the sake of unity, uh, for the sake of reconciliation in this land. But I, I put it over to you to pray about. Let's note, too, that in all of this, the gospel of Jesus Christ is definitely not a white man's message. Nor is it bound to any particular culture. It arose within the Middle East, of course, out of, uh, out of Judaism, um, but it's not of any particular culture. And every culture, and we, we've, uh, Lisa and I were up at the con to, uh, convention um, the other week, and uh, there was, he was talking, this guy was talking about Every culture, every belief, every uh, Christian denomination needs to come under the authority of the scripture, otherwise we will never find unity unless we come under the authority of the scripture. So every culture needs to be modified and to think about what the scripture has to say to our cultures. The gospel speaks to culture. Culture needs to be modified and molded by God's word to us. Because where that gospel is proclaimed, it does bring change and it shines light on a lot of confusion that exists in this world and a lot of polarization that exists particularly in the Western world today. That's what Jesus, born of the tribe of Judah, did as he preached in Galilee of the Gentiles amongst the poor man's Jews. What does Jesus preach? Well, first of all, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. How many people have you heard out on the street saying to their neighbor, repent for the kingdom of God has come near? It's important really to know what Jesus is saying here because it is essentially the same message we still need to get across. We might not use exactly the words, but still we need to get that message across to people as Christ's disciples to every people of every race. Repent, of course, means to change your mind. Change your mind about God. Change your mind about Jesus. Change your mind about sin, what sin really means, what it is, what it's all about. And changing your mind also implies moving in a different direction, from moving one direction to turning around and going the other way. The, the phrase, I repent of my sins, is a sentence in the baptism and confirmation services in the Anglican prayer book. So if we want followers, the people to be followers of Christ, we need to repent of our sins and our attitude towards God and towards Jesus Christ. So included in that idea of repentance is a change of our relationship to God, a change of our relationship to Jesus. But Jesus also says... For, you've got to repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, many of his listeners would have understood the idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, if you like, as, as Matthew terms it, would mean God's rule on earth. It would be you know, something you could see. It would be a physical thing uh, where the surrounding nations would all be subdued and particularly the Jewish people would be supreme and peace would reign. It would be like going back to the, the latter reign of David, uh, King David and the beginnings of Solomon's reign where the kingdom, was, the kingdom of uh, Israel was at its greatest extent and there was peace in the land. Israel was actually the superpower of the day at that stage. Now we realize, of course, that kingdom of God means more than just a God's rule on earth amongst the nations, we realize that the kingdom of God refers to both Jews and Gentiles, people of every race. Those people who submit to God's rule in their lives, 
from every race, from every nation. So it's encapsulated in that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, your kingdom come. And connected to that is your will be done. Because if I'm asking for God's kingdom to come, I'm asking for his will to be done in my life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, the kingdom of heaven on earth was represented then in the very form of Jesus Christ. He was the great example of what the kingdom of God should be like and what it should look like on earth because he submitted to the will of God completely. God was king. To the extent that what we, when we look at what Jesus said and when we look at what he did, when we look at the, the scriptures, we can actually see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God working in the lives of people and the outworking of what that did. You see, when people acknowledge who Jesus was, they recognized that the kingdom of God had actually come to them. When they saw what he did, they saw this is God at work. This is God being supreme. This is God overruling the circumstances of life. This is change taking place. We can see it just in the, in the passages we've read this morning in the gospel. So with the, the kingdom of God coming, Jesus calls the disciples to follow him. Jesus sees Peter and his brother Andrew and he says, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. They were fishermen on the, on the shore of the lake. He says, come and fish for people. Perhaps if they'd been carpenters and he'd gone into a carpenter's shop, he would have said, I'll help you to fashion followers after me. Or if he'd been uh, calling tax collectors, he might have said, I'll turn you into collectors of people instead of collectors of taxes. But he's talking to fishermen. So he says, come, we'll fish for people. What's he saying to us? What does he have in store for your life, for my life, for our life together as a church here in Nelson Bay? You see, repenting and turning to Christ means turning away from being in charge of our own lives and putting Jesus in charge over us. So what's he calling us to do as a result of that, as he calls us to follow him? What's he calling us away from? What do we need to leave behind and turn from in order to turn to him? At the moment of the call to the, of the disciples, they chose to follow Jesus, to leave their nets and to go and to fish for people. They entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ where he was the master, he was the rabbi, he was the teacher who was in charge of their lives. And they followed him willingly. And they took on that purpose to fish for others as well. They turned away from that which had been central to their lives, fishing, to follow Jesus Christ. Now the call of Jesus today is not so very different from that. He wants to direct your life, to be in charge of your life. He may not be telling you to give up your job or to give up what you're doing during the day. He may be saying, let's take that, let's take your job, let's take what you're doing and let's use it for the kingdom to fish for people. But he is asking us to fish for people. He's asking for that to be the number one priority. He wants to give us a ministry and a purpose in his kingdom and he wants to occupy the first place in our lives. Whatever other ministry we may, may have in church life, he is calling us to fish for people. I've sometimes wondered what it would have been like if those disciples had uh, said, look, look, Jesus, um, this is our living. You know, we go fishing every day. How are we going to get by if we don't fish? You know, the families are going to starve. We've got to look after them. Uh, we don't have time to be giving up our living and follow you around the countryside all over the place. Had they done that, they would have lived out their existence, probably, and they would have disappeared into history, probably unnamed, into obscurity. Think what they had missed out, would have missed out on. These people Jesus used to change the world. And I, I don't say that in any sort of sense of hyperbole. They did change the world. There was a guy called Paul Harvey, 
who once said, too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but keepers of the aquarium. <laughs> so what about you? Jesus calls you to make disciples. It's there in Matthew 28. It's the great commission, the great command to all Christians, go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. There's the promise that goes with it. Lo, I am with you always. Jesus calls us to ride the roller coaster of his kingdom and to reach the potential that he has for us as he calls us to be his followers. He's not calling us to neglect our families, by the way, but when we follow Jesus, it will enrich our families in one way or another. So, will you take the challenge today, or will you settle for less? Because if you aren't fishing for people, somebody said, you aren't really following. If you're not fishing for people, you're not really following Jesus. There's a guy called James Walker who was an American pastor, and he spoke at a convention and challenged churches to get by to doing what he called the family business, which is fishing for people. And he told a story about a group of fishermen who uh, became experts uh, at fishing. And he said they knew it was their calling, it was their passion, he said. They would speak about it regularly, telling fishing stories about the fish they had caught. And they would discuss better strategies and philosophies and programs for fishing. They learned about fishing equipment and fishing bait. And they had a motto that said, fishing is our bottom line. The problem was that nobody actually went fishing. They only sat and talked about it. And Walker continued and said that uh, one day there was a man who actually went out and caught a few big fish. And he came back and told everybody about it. And they were so excited. They said, look, you've got to go out on the road and tell all the other groups, uh, the, all the other fishing groups about it. So he went out on the road and he told all the other fishing groups about these fish that he caught. Uh, but he gave up fishing himself in the process. And he said, Walker said, that is the picture of many of our churches today. We are a fishing industry franchise, but we forgot what we were supposed to be doing. But in our text from Matthew, the kingdom came to Peter and Andrew and to James and John, and they followed Jesus, and they were able to see the kingdom at work in his preaching and in the things that he did. When we look at the kingdom and the ministry of Jesus, listen to what he was actually doing as he went around. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread over all Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. You see, Jesus not only preached about the king, God's kingdom and rule in the lives of people, but he showed the difference that it makes when God's kingdom comes into the life of, of a person. There was an effect on disease and sickness which ultimately are the results of sin in the world. It doesn't mean to say that if you are ill today, it's because you sinned, but because there is sin in the world. And from the very beginning, people have turned their back on God and it affects everybody one way or another. So these are the results of that sort of thing. So when God's kingdom comes, disease is actually dealt with. And it gives us the assurance that when God's kingdom finally comes, when Christ returns, that all that will be dealt with. There will be no more disease, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more tears. Uh, everything will be put right once again. Now amongst those healings, we see that there was deliverance from the demon possessed. Because the realm of evil cannot stand against the kingdom of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. And we don't hear a lot about that sort of thing in the Western world, although you'd be surprised how much prevalence there is of it around. Uh, I'm in touch with a young priest in Kenya, uh, a, a guy, a Kenyan guy, whose ministry takes him around East Africa and he goes to schools and, and all sorts of different places. 
And during his ministry, he is frequently engaged in deliverance ministry, delivering people from evil spirits uh, of which they are possessed. Does it happen today in our culture? Well, uh, maybe more than we think, but certainly the devil is still at work amongst us. The de I, I see it in all sorts of communities, Christian communities, where the devil is there to drive wedges between people, drive people apart and cause disunity. I think he's here in society generally in trying to drive a wedge between people, to polarize people, and isn't he successful? If you look at the Western world today, there, there are extremes at both ends, and uh, you know, it's as if the two will never meet in the middle. The only way that we will meet is to come under God's kingdom come into God's kingdom under his grace and under his power and to see the devil being driven back because God's love and his compassion overrules it all. And again in this passage in Matthew 4 is the assurance that through the preaching and the demonstration of the kingdom of heaven at work that when Christ returns we will see perfect justice for people we will see evil dealt with once and for all, and all things then will indeed be put right. And as we wait for that time, Jesus is still at work in the world, bringing light to those who will receive him, healing people who are in distress, healing people of diseases even, and delivering people from the grip of evil, uniting people in his name, bringing them together in compassion and love for one another, people from all continents, people from all cultures, and even people who are polarized in opinion to bring them together. And finally, what was the result of the preaching and the teaching and the healing? Well, people recognized it. They saw it for what it was, and large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed Jesus. They saw something that was worth following. They saw a person who could make a difference in their lives. And that person still makes a difference today. We want to see people today turn and follow Jesus Christ as Lord. In a world that is so confused and so polarized, this is where the light shines through Jesus Christ. At work within us as individuals, but at work within us as those who have come together united in Jesus. Will you be a part of that? Will you take up fishing for people again? I pray that we may, as God's people, move out in the power of his spirit and see him at work in our lives and in our church. Amen.